Welcome back to my studio, folks. I am so pleased you've joined me today. Web workshop number three in our series of introductories. And uh, it's a session on silk painting. Oh, I've got a confession to make. I am an addicted silk painter. I fell in love with traditional silk painting back in 1989 when I was attending a course in Brisbane on contemporary textiles two wonderful weeks of learning all sorts of skills. My aim of attending the course was to improve my skills as a hobby text lady. Uh, if you've read my um, innovative technology leaflet, you'll know <laughs> a bit about my background. Yes, I was doing all these sorts of things with his products way back then and being very, very successful with them because as an old high school teacher, I wanted to teach people to be creative and not just necessarily follow a fixed plan for designing. Yep, so as part of one tiny little segment of that course, one hour and a half was all we had, I learned traditional silk painting. And it was love at first try. It's a style of silk painting where the lines are applied to the silk, allowed to dry, and then the colour is applied within the lines. There's nothing new about this style. It started in southern France about 500 years ago. We tend to think about um, silk as having come from the east, from China and so forth, but I'm sure you've heard of the Silk Road and there are some incredible stories of how silkworms actually made themselves made their way from the eastern countries into southern Europe. Yeah, people have died so we could enjoy this. Monks were beheaded if they were caught smuggling eggs out of China, silkworm eggs out of China. They used to do that in their walking canes. Hmm. So here we go. We're going to enjoy the skills. I'm sure the products back then were a lot different and you'll just see how easy it is to use our liquid radiance in conjunction with all these skills. Originally, liquid radiance was designed for silk painting because I couldn't do my silk painting with the products I had been using way back then. I went out and bought all sorts of things, dyes, brushes, I bought a big electric silk steamer so that I could steam the silks. And what I experienced back then were the complexities of working with dyes. You'd have this one that would work on silk and cotton and another one that would work on silk and wool and some might work on all three. And then they'd all have different methods of fixing them into the fibres. Yeah, it was a complicated old life. My life with other people's products came to an end via a letter of closure in the mail. And it was sort of like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I wanted to continue enjoying all the skills I'd loved doing for so long. And I thought, well, maybe we could find another product that was a lot simpler to use than the dyes that I'd been working with. Couldn't find it. Next move, let's make it. So there began my journey with Derivan, a, an Australian company, makers of the finest acrylics. I wanted nothing but the best. And it had been marvellous to be able to go to them with what I wanted the products to do and what I didn't want them to do so that we could design our own product. And the initial goal was for silk painting and it was then that I wanted more which we now know can, the product can be used on all sorts of other fabrics as well, any other fabric whatsoever. But I wasn't going to let up on anything I enjoyed about silk painting. So the paint chemist <laughs> must have been tearing his hair out at times, I think, with all my requests and how about we do this and how about we tweak it that way. But it wasn't going to be put on the market until we got it right. Yeah, I hope you love liquid radiance as much as I do. The simplicity of silk painting now is amazing. Can the things I'm going to show you in this workshop be used on other fabrics than silk? 
The resist skills, no, because nobody can make silk quite like a silkworm. And we will do the bit more explanation about that in our next session. But the all over skills where we're not using resist, yes, you definitely can. There are silks, different silks that can be used too. The one that I'm using for my projects today is Eight Mommy Jap. Now the mommy refers to the weave of the silk and is the number of threads in a tiny square area of that silk. Um, an Eight Mommy Silk has eight threads in it. A 12 mommy has 12. The higher the number, the more threads there are in that little square area. It's a bit like a percale um, when you're talking about bed linen and so on. Okay, the weave of the silk, this one is Jap or Habitai. It's a finely woven, evenly woven silk that makes it perfect for the colours to flow evenly through the fibres as you're painting it. So Eight Mommy Jap is the one I'm using today. I've got three words for you with regard to silk painting. One is sensitive. Silk will pick up grot from the atmosphere. It'll pick up grot from your work surfaces. It'll pick up grot from dirty fingers. So the first thing I did, or the, sorry, the last thing I did before I came into this session was give my hands a good wash with soap and water. And my bench top, when I remove all the bits and pieces from it, is clean underneath. Yes, it's a clean sheet, so there's no dust or dirt on the sheet either, or salt. Okay, handling the silk. The silk is sensible. The silk knows how to behave. Hmm. It doesn't like to be cut. We're going to cut it with a snip and rip. So with my scissors, I'm going to cut this piece in half. I'm going to snip it about two fingers or one and a half fingers long, about half an inch, just over a centimetre. I'm going to grip it either side of that snip and I'm going to rip it gently and try to put on my brakes before I get to the other end. If you don't, you get all sorts of hairy bits that you've got to get rid of and then snip that through. So snip, grip and rip is the way to handle your silk. Or more accurately, snip, grip, rip and snip. Okay, I am going to take off those hairy bits now because they can, you, can act as wicks and get caught up under the silk. And when you're painting away, you thought, think, I didn't put that colour there. Well, no, it'll be because there's a bit of silk caught up underneath and the uh, colours travelled along the wick. Now, those bits of silk are not going to be put back on your work surface. They can be put in a bin or you can put them on your clothes because silk painters always have silk hanging off the clothes somewhere and you're halfway to being a silk painter. The other sensible part of silk is you can be working away with it and slaving away at it and thinking it's not doing what I want it to do. What you've got to remember is that silk knows best. It is sensible. There are times when I'm thinking, oh, just leave it alone, Anne, and see what it does. And I hope you adopt that same attitude too. We've got to remember when we're working with liquid radiance that the old rules, excess is the enemy. If you put too much in, your fabrics are going to end up stiff and dull. Well, that's definitely an enemy when you're doing silk painting because the more you slave away at it, the more it's going to get confused and it won't, won't, won't know what to do. So just stop and see what the silk does. You'll usually be impressed. The third S word, so we've covered sensitive and sensible. The third one is sensational. The feeling you get when you first put that brush to silk, I can still remember it. I felt so clever to see that colour just bleed beautifully and stop at the lines. The end result is sensational too. And there is another S word I'll sneak in there. It's called stunning. But my silk workshops are in general called sensational, um, sensational silk. Yeah, because it really is a wonderful thing to do. And I suppose I should say to you now, 
If you don't want to get addicted to this, you better switch off your program right now because we're about to go into the addictive part and just show you how to get onto all this. In this session, I'm not going to cover everything you see on the bench in front of me. We're certainly going to start you going with the resist skills. And I can remember back to when I started a long time ago, oh, it took me about six months before I felt confident with what I was actually doing and the way I was going about it, just getting the brushwork right and the lines at times as well. So I played on abstract pieces, just wavy lines and dots and circles and just odds and ends until I got the hang of it. About six months later, I felt, I think I know what I'm doing now. I can promise you that if you were coming to my studio and you were sitting at the tables just beyond my cameras over there and we were doing a two-day workshop, Sure, we'd learn the things I'm about to show you now on day one, but by about lunchtime on day two, you'd be thinking, I think I've got it, because I just find liquid radiance so much simpler to use, but still produces the same amazing effects. So I'm going to have a little tidy up on my bench now. Yes, we'll be doing abstract shapes today, but we will move on to other things, and it will be butterflies, in our next session. The reason I have the fish project in front of me today is that was in uh, Embellish magazine uh, June a couple of years ago. And he's a lovely simple one too, but I can't teach you as much on fish as I can on butterflies. So it'll be butterflies in our second silk session. As part of our play today too, I'm going to do some opalizing and some watermarking with you and just show you some fun overall skills that will work on other fabrics as well. My sensational silk handbook will carry you through these techniques and there are some patterns in there as well. Okay, for our resist skills, it is really important that we're working with our silk stretched across a frame or a hoop. When I got home from that college course all those years ago, I didn't have anything to stretch my silk, well, nothing formal. So I found cardboard boxes and styrene foam boxes and, and big dishes in the, in the kitchen and had them um, used as my stretchers using rubber bands and pins and drawing pins and whatever I could find to actually keep the silk stretched tight across that surface. Uh, we, we need to work with air, both sides, when we're doing this traditional style of silk painting. So that we don't have smudges happen, it's a good idea to pin the corners of your silk. I'm calling this on when I'm working on something round and these are the plastic flexi hoops. When I'm working on something like this, those corners can flap around and actually um, spoil your line work and your colors. So putting it, rolling it up and putting a pin in there, I call taming the flappy bits. I'm just gonna leave it at the one I think we can make do with that but you know it would be wise to to pin up all three or the other three as well okay once we've got our silk stretched and I'll be teaching you to use um, pins in a frame in our next session we need to choose our resists one of the products that I've harassed our paint chemists for was a water-based product that would create the lines that are so typical of traditional silk painting. Way back when all this started, heaven only knows what they were really using, but solvent-based gutters that left the silk white was where, I, where it started for me. 
solvent-based, part of the petrochemical industry. I wanted that out of my life. So we have our water-soluble resist. And this is the replacement for when you want your silk to remain white during your project. But folks, it's not the easiest one to work with because it is water soluble. When you're learning your skills, I've got something easier for you to get a good result because I want to show you what happens if you get a bit carried away with your colour in a design area. Let's find the right bit. Yeah, there we go. If I don't drop it. And I'm sure you can see here that the colour has actually bled into the line and the line is no longer white. So yeah, that's a trap for young players or for new players in the silk painting art. Um, yeah, when you've had a bit of practice and you've developed your touch with all this, then definitely swing to your water soluble resist because the results are very, very authentically traditional silk. Whatever shape or design you want to use. Over time, however, all sorts of different gutters were developed. Now, you most you probably noticed I'm not using the word gutter very much at all. Gutter refers both to the uh, the product that's used for the lines and the technique. Over years, I've used all sorts of different gutters as well. And if you have some at home that you need to use up, uh, they'll work equally well with liquid radiance. I have used dimensional paints as gutters, and they work perfectly well too, provided you get the application right, and that's about what I'm about to show you. But recently, in a random conversation, I was talking about glass painting with our manufacturers. I'll just pop something under that so it's not quite so bright. And the end result of that has been a product we now have called Gloss. It was developed for glass painting. By adding liquid radiance concentrate to the gloss, you can create whatever colour you want for working on glass surfaces. And that's another story. We're not doing that today. But guys, in my typical methods of, oh my goodness, what else can we do with this? I decided that all those amazing colours we could make were perfect for our line work in silk painting. So I'm going to show you how to make a gloss resist. I have a black one there and a, an orange one there, which looks very much like gold. To do this, we need a little applicator bottle. Now this is different from the dispenser bottles that we use with our colors. Okay, it has the same little pointy nozzle for those of you who are familiar with the water soluble, uh, the water soluble techniques that we have done in an earlier session. Okay, that's the same bottle. We're going to take out that little cap, squeeze and lift, and into that bottle we're going to put about a third of a bottle of gloss. If you're squeezing and nothing's coming out, don't keep squeezing. It means there may be a blockage in that nozzle. So I'll just keep working here for a moment and then show you how to clear the blockage if one occurs. The aim is to have it to look after them so it doesn't happen. But it's a product that can dry in that nozzle and if the blockage occurs, you simply take a pin poke it in, stir it around, pull it out at a bit of an angle, and then please use some craft paper. We've talked about that before. 
to wipe your pin so that next time you're going to clear a blockage, you're not putting a blockage back in. Now that didn't need it. Next important thing is when you put the caps back on these bottles, you put it on as far as it will go because they're designed so that the inside of the cap sits against the end of the nozzle and stops the air from getting at it anyway. The blockage is likely to occur if the cap's not on properly or if you've had the, the bottle sitting without a cap for too long. Um, yeah. <laughs> so of course it's going to dry up. Okay, so we've got our gloss ready. I would not use this for my resist lines unless I wanted a transparent or translucent line. What I'm now going to do is add some liquid radiance colour to that. For my black, I've simply added black concentrate. Um, whatever colour I want, I can mix. I've made up a chocolate, which is brown and black. I've made up a navy, which is blue and black. I've made up a, an aubergine, which is purple and red. Today, I'm going to make up an orange because it does look like gold when you apply it to the silk. Next session, we'll talk about how to get real gold. So into that, I'm going to put about half a dozen drops of yellow concentrate. Not the watered down ones. Definitely important to use your concentrates. And a little bit of red, and these are open from a previous session. So just a couple of drops of red. In all, you're probably looking at about 10 to 12 drops of concentrate into a third of a bottle of gloss. Pop it, I don't need the cap on it. Pop the, my finger over the end. I'm going to shake that and my resist is mixed. At this point it will be a bit bubbly so my recommendation is that you leave it for 24 hours at least overnight <laughs> to give the bubbles time to settle before you use it on your silk for line work. So when people talk about gutta, spelt G-U-T-T-A, I'm talking resist. You see gutta written and you think, how do I pronounce that? Gutta? Gutta? I don't know. You see, oh, and it's a German word that means something like resist. I believe it's a German word. When you say, hear the word resist, I'm a fair dinkum Aussie. I can spell it, I can pronounce it. Okay, doke. So we've got our beautiful orange resist now made up. I'll pop the cap back on that and that'll sit around until I'm ready to use it. Practicing using the resists now becomes very important. Well, I think so. Because it does take a little while just to get the hang of holding your mouth right with it. I'm going to use black because it's beautifully visible. I will flop that down behind the nozzle. If it's been sitting on its tail, on its bottom, the, the, the resist is all going to be down the wrong end. So we flop it down so it's where we want it. We remove the cap. We get some craft paper, tissue, whatever you've got. And here we go. We're going to start that into the paper. And that means it's ready for action. We're going to hold these just like a fat pen, but make sure your thumb is on the soft bit of the bottle, not up on the shoulder. It's difficult to get control up there. Just float this around for a while to get the feel of how it flows. We're actually pressing quite firmly into the silk and that's why it's good to have it stretched. The aim of using the resist is to create like little dams that will hold the colour in. And I've only done lines there so far because I'm showing you how to practice. We make the little dams by enclosing the shape. Or I could go like this 
across those lines and I'd have dams wherever there's a complete shape. Practice doing dots, practice doing all sorts of things, just practice getting comfortable with the product in your hand. It is really important as you're practicing that you remember to press firmly. Um, do things like signing your name just to get the feel of it. Whatever you want to do, but make sure you're comfortable with using this before you go on to your real work of art. When you're ready, then off you go doing your real work. Correctly applied lines will only take about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, depending on the weather, to dry. If your lines are really, really fine, it will, um, won't take that long. But remember that if your lines are really fine, they may not add as resist, uh, they may not act as resist lines anyway, because they may not have penetrated the silk. You are looking for that good penetration. to get a good sealing of that fibre. Yep, we've got our little dams. Okay, how do we know <laughs> when the lines are dry? Well, I'm certainly not going to do it here, but just simply put your finger on it, <laughs> and if it still feels tacky, leave it alone. Um, you can usually tell by looking at it with a bit of experience anyway. Is it okay to hasten the drying time with a hairdryer or something? I'm going to give you a yes and no answer to that. If you do it too soon, you will just find that you get a seal around the edge of the resist line and it may not have penetrated the fibre. So leave it at least half an hour before you do the hairdryer trick. Now we're ready to start some serious silk painting. I've prepared the resist lines, just random lines wandering across my stretched silk. So that I've got some little random shapes, abstract shapes to play in. Seriously folks, when you're getting the hang of this silk painting, getting the hang of what I'm going to teach you, it's good to have something to work on that doesn't really matter if you mess it up a bit because it will take a bit of practice. So hence those abstract shapes. I have my water prepared. I'm actually using this is for cleaning the brushes. I'm actually using a brush tub, sometimes called a brush washer. And into that, I have put not a lot of water, it just goes about a third of the way up, because I need to know that when I put my brushes in there, it's gonna care for them. They're gonna rest in those little angled bits, or we can use that ridgy bit for keeping the bristles beautifully clean and keeping your brushes in good condition. I have a towel for drying my brushes as I work. We don't want them loaded with water. A nicely paddy towel folded up is going to be perfect. Uh, what I consider a perfect set of brushes for silk painting are these. They're a Taclon style of brush, a big round one, a little round one, and a couple of medium flat ones. They're my own choice of brushes. We've got to remember that Liquid Radiance is a different product. And um, yeah, using the right brushes to get the best results is going to give us the best results. Now, I've got my colour concentrates this time. And I'm going to prepare those concentrates in a palette. With liquid radiance, we know that excess is the enemy. So we don't want lots and lots and lots of colour to dip our brushes into, but we do need enough. I'm just going to use the three primaries here. Magenta, blue, and yellow. And the sample pieces that you can see beside me have all been done with either magenta, blue and yellow or red, blue and yellow. It's good fun to play and just see how many colours you can actually create from those pre -prim three primaries as you work. 
Into that color, I'll put about a third of a dish in my palette, I'm going to add water. Now this can be just ordinary wet water from the tap. Because we're using the colors immediately, we don't have to worry about any bacterial action that we talked about in our second session of the web workshops. Yes, Liquid Radiance is a very pure product and by adding water to it with bacteria in the water we can get a bit of bacterial action. It doesn't send the product off but we've just got to strain the bacteria away or the yucky bits away. For my little exercise now, anyway I've added about an equal amount of water to the colours in my palette there. Before I start working I'm going to wet my brush and dry it. Look, if you're working with a glass tumbler or something with your water in it, that's okay. But make sure your water level is never any deeper than the ferrule of your brush. You don't want your brush handles sitting in the water. That's going to destroy your brushes. Now for the good fun. Three really important words for silk painting are dip, touch and glide. I am going to dip once into my colour. I'm going to touch once against the side of the palette. I sort of do that in one action. And I'm going to glide my brush systematically from one side of my chosen design area to the other. Remembering that our lines here are going to form like little dams. We're not going to put our brush down at the line. We're just going to watch that color bleed until it hits the line. As you feel your brush is drying out, Go back, reload with more, dip, touch and come back and glide. And you'll see that to get my colour nice and even here, I'm actually keeping the bristles of my brush within the wet edge. And that increases your stand chances of getting that nice even colour. Whoops, bit too much, Anne. Take a bit more off. We're not overloading our bristles with colour. That's important. This is giving us that nice control working down across the design area. And we simply work until we uh, reach the other side. Notice that it's not a brush, 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 double, 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 double action that I'm using. Dip once, touch once, glide, and I'm nearly finished that glide to the edge of that design shape. Don't stop halfway and do, go off and do something else because you will get dry marks and they're going to spoil your silk painting. Okay, that piece is done. Let's play with blending some colours now. Now what I haven't added to my palette is my water. I have added it to the colours, that's important. We're adding about an equal amount of water, so we're starting with a 50-50 mix for good strong colour. And I like to leave my pure colours, or my concentrate colours with water, in the dishes of the palette. When I want to mix colours, blend colours, I tend to work on the trays of the palette. So let's make some purple here from our magenta and blue. I've added more water to that and I have a now I now have a very full brush. So I'm just going to have to squish out some of that excess color so I can go back and dip, touch and once more glide. Because this color is more watered down now, it's moving a lot faster. So you're working with what the silk wants to do. Remember I said it's sensible. It knows what it wants to do. It also knows when it's full. So when that's full, leave it alone. Don't go back and fiddle. I'm going to do that same action on another part of my silk now. But instead of keeping the brush within the wet line, I'm going to take it outside of the wet line and see what happens. We get totally different markings happening. I can stroke the brush across 
and get a strong line there where the colours meet. Basically whatever you do with your brush with when you're silk painting is going to create different effects. And truly this is why I think it's a really good idea to play and just get the feel of it. I think back to when I was originally teaching myself silk painting from a tiny little bit I had during that course in Brisbane years ago and worked with dyes for years. Yeah, it took me about six months before I was confident with brush stroking um, working with dyes. But I find that with working with liquid radiance, um, it's, it's just so much simpler. Now I want to work onto this little area here because there's no dam at the corner of those um, joins. Just do some blue this time. Dip touch, glide. I'm going to play around with it a little bit. But as I go down, just so you can see different brush strokes doing different things. Gosh, that's going to work out even. Me I probably learnt my dip, touch and glide okay. Oh well, you will. As I go down to these corners, I know that if I don't sort of ease off my pressure as I get to those corners, the colour's going to sneak around the corner. So I'm coming down there very gently just with the corner of my brush. Love these flat brushes for this reason. <coughs> so yep, we're always thinking little dams to hold that colour in. Now what else can we do to that? I'm going to show you some water texturing. This little piece, um, the purpley piece that I did first, is still moist. So I'm just going to load a little bit of water into my brush and we load the water brush the same as we do the colour brush and let's put some dots on there. What that water is doing is pushing the colour away. When I was working with dyes all those years ago, dyes were not physically set until they were steamed or chemically fixed. And you could do this even after the colour was dry, but we know that when liquid radiance is dry, it's stable. You can't move it, you can't remove it. So if I were to do that on dry colour, nothing would happen. I'm going to show you some other things to do on dry colour, so we'll wait for some of this to dry. Let's mix some more colours and have some fun in the meantime. Okay. When I'm mixing into yellow, I like to always start with the lightest colour in my palette first and then add the darker to it a little at a time. So I've mixed up a little bit of burnt orange there. Let's pop it in here. I've put all sorts of fun bits in my designs. I can't draw. More about that in a blending session next time. But I can do dots, I can do squiggly things, I can do circles. So you could see when I was working in that area, I worked straight over the dotty bits. The resist line is not going to pick up the colour unless you're working with the water-soluble resist, which will definitely pick up the colour. Let's go a little bit stronger and play some more. Take the excess out of my brush and bring this down. I'm going to stripe this one. Still working systematically across my design area and see if I can get those stripy lines. Yes, I can. Remember we talked about silk being sensible though. It knows what to do. And I could agonise over this and agonise over it and agonise over it and think, oh, it's not doing what I want it to do. Well, sometimes I've just got to think, no, it w it's going to do what it wants to do. And it's usually right. Can we work back over that? Yeah, I'm going to try some yellow texturing. Instead of using water, while that colour is wet, I'm just going to pull some yellow over it. And let it push those colours around even more. <laughs> we'll learn in our next session that yellow is a bit of a bully when you're silk painting. <laughs> it's fun to play with. 
Okay, so we've got some interesting things happening. Guys, this is why it is so important to play. Just get the feel of what the silk will do. I've cleaned my brush by stroking it across the um, ridges in the palette there. And uh, yeah, let's find something else to do. Let's go to some, maybe some green. Yellow with a little bit of blue this time. And I'm going to work in my dots. Now, I love these little uh, flat brushes because you can work off the side of that brush and still get really good control over the way the colour is going into the silk. With everything I've done so far, I haven't gone into overload at any point. But if we do, we need some extra equipment. And I'm sure you've got some of these at home. Here's another rule for you in silk painting. If you can see puddles sitting on your silk, you are probably going into enemy territory and excess. And we've got to remember that liquid radiance is not a dye. If we have excess there, the excess is going to make the sti uh, fabric stiff. And I'm trying to create a puddle here. <laughs> it's easy to create a puddle when you haven't developed your touch. So I'm putting way too much in there and I'm not sure if you can actually see that shining. But what I need to do is get rid of that excess. If you can see puddles, moisture sitting on your silk, suck it up before it goes either over or with some resist through the dam wall. So we're controlling that colour into the fibre so that we're not seeing puddles. That's important. Let's finish off those green spots. It is amazing how far this goes. On a little project like this, I probably don't need that quantity of colour that I've put out on my palette today. But you need enough to be able to load your brush easily to get your best results. A tiny little bit in there is going to be too hard to get that colour bleeding across the fibres of the silk. A nice strong purple. No water in this one. There we go. We'll pop that in here. Working again off the corner of my brush. When you're thinking about the brushes to choose for the areas in which you're working, it's important to, I'm going to water that one right down, it's important to choose a brush that is appropriate to the size of the design area. So for big areas you're going to move up to your the, the, the big um, round one. For tiny areas, the little one. And of course, my favourite, which is this one. Now, I am going to have to work really quickly through there, but not so quickly that the silk is not getting full. Maybe a bit more water on that end. And because I don't, yeah, that's good. Interesting thing here, which I absolutely love in silk painting, when you've mixed a colour like this and you've got the colours still coming off your brush, you can get both colours coming off at different times. Play with that one too. I'm still working systematically across my silk, but I've got to sort of figure out where to go next so that I don't get those dry lines. When I was learning silk painting, the books I was working from said, work quickly, you need to work quickly. I quickly discovered though, that if I worked too quickly, the silk was not filling properly and it was saying, oh, give me more, give me more, give me more. So you need to just watch that flow of color through the fiber so that it is full, but not over full. 
Now I haven't got an even coverage there because I want to go back and just do some interesting texturing in that either with water or a bit more of that extra colour. I'm in a dotty bit, let's make it a bit more dotty. Love playing in water. But as I add this water I've got to remember while there's moisture, there's movement with liquid radiance. Those colours are going to still keep moving until they're dry. And I don't want to put in so much moisture that I go, go into puddles and these will just all sort of meet up and not give me the results that I want. Okay, one more thing. Don't you love those froggy noises in the brush tub? Hope you can hear them. That is ensuring that the little ridges in the brush tub are getting all the colour out from the end of the brush. And colour that dries up against the ferrule is the killer of your brushes. Okay, dry that out. What are we going to do next? Let's, let's bring some more orangey yellowy down here. I want it quite yellowy, but with a little bit of oomph. What I want to do this time is work out of colour into water. There are two ways you can go. You can either start with the water first and then add the colour or you can add, start with the colour first and then add the water. In silk painting, white is water. There is no such thing as a white and our liquid radiance range is dedicated to that principle. I've just quickly washed that colour out of my brush and I'll bring in the water and blend it down. A little bit of a waggle of the brush. There's a little bit of moisture sitting in there but I know that it's not going into puddles. And let's do some interesting things happening back up in here. Guys, this is called playing. I love to play. And I hope you will too, but remember that while there's moisture, there's movement, and those colours are going to keep moving until they are dry. Okay, I'm waiting for that pink bit to be totally dry before I can show you the next thing that I want to do, so let's just play some more. The, the three primaries are on my palette. I know that if I work with two that are side by side from the colour circle, either the uh, magenta and the blue, or the yellow and the magenta, or the blue and the magenta, I will get my secondary colours and that's what I've got so far. But I get my tertiaries then by mixing the secondaries with the primaries. Okay, if however I start mixing across my colour circle and mix them all together, okay, that was blue and yellow, we've got a really dark greeny colour, I can go into my browny blacky colours Probably not really pretty on here, but let's see what has let's show you what's happened. Play with your colours. Get familiar with them. Don't look at them and say, oh, I just want to use that one or that one, because you can make hundreds of colours of your own from the basic nine in our range, of which we are using three right now. Now let's show you what a bully that yellow really is. I'll texture back into that with yellow. It's going to push that irky murky dirty colour away. Are we getting the idea that playing is a good idea? <laughs> You really need to develop your confidence with all these skills, your blending skills, your 
water texturing, your yellow texturing, your striping the colours on, working systematically from area to area for, uh, across your design. Um, yeah, so that you can, when it's time to do the real serious painting, attack it with confidence. I just want to do this little piece in behind my signature, which I've popped into the border there. As I was doing the resist lines last night, I thought, ah, oh, that's a really skinny little bit, but I'll be able to sneak up into that with the corner of my brush quite happily. I like that little bit of dark purple, so I'm going to continue that down here. and work out of that. I want to, I haven't shown you, shown you what to do yet when you hit an oh no moment. Oh no bit meaning I've gone over the lines. Not sure that that's the same color, but does it matter? No. Oh no, I've gone over the line. Did that deliberately for you. Just grab another brush, wet it, and before that's dry, push that colour that went over the line back against the line. And honestly, when you put your next colour into that area, a blind man would be glad to see it. but I will leave that to dry before I add my next colour. Otherwise the wet water there <laughs> would make it a significantly paler colour and we would see it. So we've fixed whoopses that have gone over the lines. Let's see how we can fix other things and do exciting things to our silk painting. Piece where I started. I'm hoping that's going to be totally dry by now. Sometimes, and I'm just going to test it with a drop of water. Yeah, that's dry. Because it didn't bleed. If it bled, well then, I'd have to do something else to it, wouldn't I? Anyway, I look at this and I think, nah, I really don't like that colour there. What can I do to it? I can add colour over the top. And this time it will work very differently from applying the colour to the dry silk. Maybe I want to keep part of that colour. Maybe I'll keep a little bit of the magenta pink in this area. So I'm just going to apply water to that. And I'm hoping you can see the shine of the water sitting on there. Well, if it was too wet, we just grab the cotton bud and get that moisture away. But I want to then bring in the extra colour down on the other end. So I'm going to add blue and work it back up into the water to soften it. And then just keep moving down my piece. This time that colour is not bleeding. So it's my brushwork that's going to get the colour on there. I can remember trying to do these sorts of things with dyes way back, long before there was liquid radiance in my head. And it was just, I just couldn't do it. There's so much more that you can do when you're working with liquid radiance. This is probably a little bit slower, but I'm changing that color to something that's going to coordinate now better with my piece. Well, maybe remembering that I'm just playing and showing you a few tricks. But I have control over how I can do that. Another point to note is that I'm not pushing the brush really firmly into the silk. Now I want to blend that up. The fingers are great. 
We know it's all non-toxic. We know that we just wash our hands, soap and water, and come clean. I maybe want to do some interesting things to that, but I think it's too soon. I think that's a bit wet, so let's let that one settle down. Maybe I want to draw things in other areas of my piece. Again, this time I need to know that it's dry and I'm going to draw, what will I draw? Some birds maybe? I can draw birds. Logically, one would swap down to a little fine brush to do this, but I'm just doing this little exercise working with the one um, quarter inch flat. These, by the way, are the classic brushes in our range. We don't have a lot of equipment in our range, but what we have is perfect for the job. And if it's not easy to get out there in the marketplace, we have it for sale. I don't want a lot of colour in my brush here. I do want a stronger blue because I'm going to be working blue over blue. So I've added a little bit of magenta to that. If I'm a bit afraid that my brush is overloaded, I'm going to grab some craft paper or tissue. I'm going to make a little pad of that and I can suck the excess moisture from the brush by just dabbing that against the ferrule not down at the action end where I want to use it. And this is the right way up. Let's draw a couple of... Oh we might go the wavy lines, the spermy things in there. Continue that thing. I took too much out didn't I? I was just trying to show you how to be good. Now you see that colour is not bleeding across the fabric because liquid radiance is stable when it's dry. That base colour is holding the markings I'm putting on there. If I were to do that, and I've taken a lot out of my brush by now, straight onto the silk, that will bleed like crazy. So there's a real advantage of having a base colour to be able to do that drawing on technique and get some fabulous results. It's a beaut way if you've um, had a whoopsie. Like the time I was talking with a brush in my mouth and the brush came out. We shouldn't do that anyway, that was a bit silly. But yeah, the brush came out of my mouth and it bounced, bounced, bounced across my work. And we're going to see the end result of that in my next um, demonstration where we do blending on silk. Okay. The blue is still wet. I did get a bit carried away and it has leaked into the border but that's dry. I can't fix that. I'll have to fix that somehow else later on, some other way. But where it's still wet here, I can moist, uh, water texture that back to the base colour. And this is a beautiful technique that I will take you into again in our next session. While there's moisture, there's movement though. Those colours will keep continuing to bleed. Push, 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 push. The colour's stronger there. And the spell's probably wetter because that's where I finished off. So this is all about now listening or letting the silk talk to you and listening to what it's saying to you. Am I too wet? Am I too dry? What can I do here? And trying things, again, building up your confidence so you can move into your real works of art without having to think, oh, I don't like that bit, and you know how to fix it. If I had completed this whole piece, I would have used up more of the colours on my palette so there wouldn't be quite so much left. But anything that's left on your palette, of course, we're going to use for something else. And my next thing is going to be to show you how to make an amazing scarf from those leftover colours so that we don't waste a thing. Liquid radiance does need to be heat set. 
To respect the cold cure time of the resist lines that we, we're using in these pieces, it's a good idea to leave it um, 24 hours at least to dry or to cure because it is dry. Sorry, I blew that one, didn't I? Yep, okay, so we're going to give it its curing time. We're going to cover it with an old linen tea towel or an applique mat or something to protect it and then iron it either back or front. The beauty of this traditional silk painting is that you're going to get the same results front and back. I told you it was addictive. I'm addicted. Hope you get that way too. Before I leave this session, I'm going to show you a couple of really fun techniques that are all over colouring techniques and some of the first things I ever learned when I was silk painting. With dyes, it's a very different story from working with liquid radiance. Anyway, let's do it. I'll just put that palette aside for later. All that lovely colour is too good to waste. We'll certainly be using that up. So the first thing we're going to do is a technique called opalising. Just get a board to pop on that. We need some kitchen foil. And the foil needs to be about a third again the size of your fabric. We're going to scrunch it up into hills and valleys. I'm hoping that's not flaring too much on camera. And we simply lay our silk on top of this. Now this doesn't have to be silk, but it's a silk painting workshop so I'm using silk. It can be any lightweight fabric that's sort of evenly woven to work best. What I like to do before I actually colour my silk is give it a very light spray with water. Very light, Anne. It just helps the colours get the message that you want them to move. And folks, we are not going to use our concentrates for this. If we think back to Web Workshop 1, where we were working with liquid radiance diluted colours, uh, I'm using my one quarter concentrate, three quarters water diluted colours for my opalising. And I'm simply going to drop colour. Not from a great height, nice and close down onto that silk. The fun bit is watching this sort of meander across the hills and down into the valleys. Okay, so magenta. We've got to remember while there's moisture, there's movement. Their colours are going to keep travelling while that silk is wet. If I had a really big piece to do, I'd work systematically along it so that I didn't get any drying lines forming. So I'd do a bit, get it all um, finished, spray wet the edge of it so that it didn't get dry marks and then keep moving. Now we can start to see those colors really dribbling around. This is the exciting bit. But I've got to remember that I'm working with liquid radiance. If I were working with dyes and I put too much in, the excess would actually come out in the steaming and the rinsing and all the processing that I would have had to do back then. But with liquid radiance, when it's dry, it's stable. We've got to remember that with everything we do. And if I put too much in, the excess will make this end up stiff and dull and ugly. The sample piece you see in front of me actually has salt added. And on a day like today that's really wet outside and windy, there's no way I would have done salting techniques on a rainy day with dyes because they just keep wetting themselves. 
But I am quite happy to add salt to that piece now. I will use my favourite, my goof proof salt, which is Epsom. In a little spice sh shaker for convenience. Those colours are going to keep moving and by salting it, Epsom doesn't draw in moisture from the atmosphere in the same way as you, your sodium chloride, your food type salts do. So on a day like today, any salt will work with liquid radiance, but the Epsom is not going to pull in the moisture from the atmosphere in the same way as the others. The others would just work and take longer to dry. And that is how this one started. You can see the salt has done its thing, the movement is there. And we just put that one aside to dry. At the end of that, when it is totally dry, remove the salt, rinse at least three times. And you've learned those good habits, hopefully, from the earlier sessions. If you're just doing this on YouTube and pulling up silk painting about now, go back to session one and you'll hit, um, hear about all the good, good rules. One more little play for you that is different from anything we've handled so far is called watermarking. And I have here a little set of knickers, cami top and bra that's been done with this technique. You get the most incredibly soft colours. And this is synthetic fabric that this has been done on. It works equally well on silk. The colours on the purple green here were probably about 1 in 15, 1 in 20 with water, so significantly more dilute than the colours I'm about to use now. From my other sessions, you're probably familiar with me working on a black board, a black covered plastic board. Um, I've just put some white plastic over it today because, for this piece, because it's really hard to see wet silk on a black board. I am going to wet that in my brush tub, that's the handiest water. Except you can't see what I'm doing. Squeeze it out. I don't mind if this one's actually a little bit drippy. But the key to this one is to just flop that silk onto the plastic without smoothing it out. We actually want hills and valleys. We want the uppy-downy bits because they are what's going to make the pattern I don't want to make them too high though. Okay, I think I've got some good hills and valleys there. Now, let's go some teal. This is a blue-green mix. As I drop the colours onto this one, you'll immediately start to see them move along the bubbles formed with the plastic, uh, with the silk against the plastic. That's exactly what we want. And as the water dries up, the colour will move into the places left by the water. It's actually a beautiful technique to do with just one colour. Good one to play with, see what happens. But I can't help myself, I'm going to use more than one. Let's go some lime, which is the yellow green mix. I like to put the colours close to the edge of those hills so that they can track along the bubbles. 
and it's a really important one here that you know when to stop so that it doesn't go too far or fill up too much. Nearly there. Oh, that was a nice one. I think it's just about time to leave it alone, Anne. Yep, we'll call that done and we'll put it aside to dry. So, here's one I prepared earlier. No, it didn't change colour in the process. We've learned in our previous um, sessions that when liquid radiance is dry, the fabric can be significantly stiffer than the normal feel and fall of the fabric. Ironing it to heat set it is most important and ironing it also takes out that stiffness. I would, when I'm ready to iron it, spray that with water, flatten it out on my ironing board. This one's just been lifted up off its surface, off the plastic surface. And you can see how it really looks a whole lot better when it's flattened out. So the ironing does two things. It maximizes the life of the color in the fiber and de-stresses the fiber. I'm just de-stressing this slightly differently now. A bit of revision for those of you who've seen the other sessions. And that softness is coming back into the silk already. So yes, you will fall in love with your iron and your ironing board. Remember though, that when you've used the salting techniques, it is important that you take away that salt scrape it off and then rinse the saltiness out of your fabric before you iron it. You don't want salt all over your iron or your ironing board and you certainly don't want it through your sewing machine if you're going to sew with that fabric. Um, you may or may not have caught up with my articles in Embellish. It's now March 2021. This is issue 45 where I have a, um, an article called From the Pantry, Designing Textured Fabrics. I go into salting techniques on this one. If you can't pick up a current issue or if it's way down the track when you, you're listening to this um, YouTube, YouTube recording, we usually keep the, um, the back issues or you may be able to get them from Embellish Girls. Yep, so there's all sorts of salting, sugaring techniques in there that I'm sure you'll find lots of fun. Because it is a silk workshop though, let's give brief mention to the silk scarf I'm wearing. It's actually a mop-up. From a couple of other scarves I was doing, they just had too much moisture in them, so I'd lay this flat out on top and just dabbed away and mopped up the excess colours from that. Love that one. I'm now going to take this one off. The best way to wear a scarf without having it fly away in the breeze is to use either a name badge or a pin. And I actually have a little gold safety pin inside my scarf here. Take that off. I'll put it back so it's there ready for next time. Just tuck it in the hem there. And I want to show you how to do a really clever scarf. And I have a hanger full of these in my bedroom. I'm going to show you how to do one of these. Many's the time we are going to be 
doing things around the house. We've got an old T-shirt on. We think, oh, my goodness, I really need something that I've got to get for dinner. I've just got to duck off to the supermarket. You pop one of these silk scarves on and a gold chain. Nobody knows you're wearing your daggy old shirt. No, this one isn't a daggy old one. It's just old. <laughs> um, yeah, and you go out as a perfectly well-dressed woman. So we have all this colour left on our palette from what we've been working with and it's way too good to waste. I actually started doing these things when I was demonstrating with Better Homes and Gardens uh, back in the early 2000s. I had a project in the magazine and for a couple of years after that, I was demonstrating with the girls uh, at the craft stands through the craft shows across Australia. So yes, this um, technique has been not seen at the shows, but I'd have all the colour left while I was demonstrating through the day. And the girls at the stands would say to me, Annie, are you just about ready to come home? Yep, just give me a couple of minutes. I would grab a lump of silk. That's a square. Snipped and ripped. I would put it in my water, my leftovers from colouring during the day. Well, let's face it, it's all the colours that are on the palette anyway. So does it matter if it's slightly coloured? No. I'd squeeze that out. I would then grab a sheet of plastic. It would usually be a Better Homes and Garden show bank that didn't have any colour in it yet. And I would spread that on my work surface. Now, we're going to roughly concertina that silk. Flip, 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 flip. Because I need that to fit across the colours on my palette. So let's just fold that down a bit. Tuck the ends in, that looks about right. And press it in. Now they're saying, okay, we've finished counting the cash. Um, you're just about ready, Ant. Yep, nearly there. Doesn't matter if those colours go across there a bit. I want that way. Be careful when you're doing this sort of a mop-up. The colour is a paint. By definition, liquid radiance is a paint. You know that. So it's going to form some dry patches. Try not to pick those dry patches up. Now... Time for me to go home, to grab my gear and go. I would simply wrap up my piece of silk in some plastic, tie it up, just in my hand, poke it in my handbag, and off I'd go to wherever my accommodation was, wherever the show was at the time. And um, yeah, I'd have a beautifully blended piece of silk by the time I got home to my accommodation, not weeks later. On arrival home, let's see what happens. I would put an old sheet or an old towel, well, I'm at home in my studio, so I'm using a plastic covered board. Put that on my bench surface. Open up my work of art. This is one from earlier today, not the one I've just done. This one's needed time to blend. It's doing its own thing while it's all enclosed in the plastic. And we then open it up. Mine will be fairly wet because there was a lot of leftover colour there. And there are a couple of patches there that don't have any colour. Does that matter? No, we can just share a bit. I like them a little bit murky anyway. We know that it's safe to do this with your fingers. Soap and water and a nail brush fixes everything. Lay that out. And really, this is fairly wet, so in reality, I'm going to um, get another piece of fabric and mop the excess up from that one. 
It could be something like the scarf I was wearing earlier. Well, for most of the session. So you can see the moisture sitting on top of that. Do I have something handy I can grab? No, not really. So we'll just leave it at that. And um, yes, believe it or not, that's what I would then when it's mopped out. Seeing that one is really, really wet. I really should mop it up. I'll just lay another couple of pieces of silk in there. And I'm sure I can find Christmas bobbles or glasses cases or something to make with that. Excess is gone. It could have been a piece of lightweight cotton. Put those aside to dry. That's much better. Now I can tell that silk doesn't have the sloppiness that it had a moment ago. Wow. <laughs> It's a worry. We quite regularly like our mop-ups better than our real pieces. And this one, we're ready to scrunch. Sorry about running away there for a moment, folks. I will show you the end result in a jiffy. Scrunch it into its hills and valleys. Up is going to go dark, down is going to go light. And we can either leave it to dry without salt or with salt, or with sugar, knowing that everything we do to it is going to cause different markings to happen. I think I'll go the Epsom salts again, seeing it is raining outside. And this will be a lot quicker. Gently bently, knowing every grain of salt is going to draw colour to it. If you put too much on, it just doesn't know where to turn. The colour doesn't, that is. Or if you're doing sugar, even gentlier bentlier, in that the sugar is going to strip the colour from where it dissolves, leaving the spooky markings that you saw in the other sessions. Yeah, I hope you can get hold of that magazine. Move that away. We'll show you how to tie one of these scarves. I have a sugared scarf, square, that was a palette mop-up. You can see the different markings from the sugar. Where the sugar has been dissolved, the colour gets lifted out of the fabric. To make one of the scarves I'm now wearing, we simply go corner to corner with first fold, bring it back, bring it back two or three more times. I could go thirds or I could go half, half, depending how I want it. And then twist and twist and twist and twist and twist and twist and twist. And a lot of the time I don't even bother hemming these scarves. But if you want a really neat, easy way to hem, you'll find my method in the um, Sensational Silk Handbook. It's simply a case of using your widest machine stitch on your shortest machine stitch length. And it brings it into the most beautiful little fine edge. A couple of knots in the back and you've got your new scarf to put on over your daggy t-shirt and you can pop off shopping looking beautiful. We need some good habits for our cleaning up. Palettes are going to be cleaned with either soap or detergent and an old toothbrush. Don't ever use anything abrasive on your palettes. For your brushes, I'll leave that there, we dip them in water, stroke them across a cake of soap, and then do the grip and waggle. 
In reality, we're using a nylon brush and liquid radiance colours any fibre whatsoever. So that waggling is going to get as much of the remaining colour out of the brush as we can. Rinse it thoroughly under water, teasing it out as you work to get all the soapiness out of it before you put it away. You may need to do that two or three times. With your a dispenser caps, just a damp chucks to wipe the dried on colour. It is a paint, so it's going to form a skin. And if it sort of gets stuck in there, use an old soft toothbrush. For cleaning your boards, a mesh scrubber is perfect with a bit of detergent or soap in it and give them a good old rub, especially your black colored ones because you can't see any dried on color on those. Now, those of you who are doing my web workshops will know all about the fact that you can, well, you've received all these bits of literature from me uh, via email. For those of you who are just catching up via YouTube, Make sure you go into the Ed Centre, Education Centre of my website and you can find um, PDFs of all the literature that I've handed out. It's all free to download and um, yeah, it, it, just support notes to help you with uh, extra details for the sessions that we're doing together. There's lots to be learnt in there and um, yeah, happy creating. <sighs> happy silk painting especially from this session. Next time we will do some blending techniques and we'll see you then.